Hey everybody, it's low carb and keto friendly nutritionist Amy Berger from toitnutrition.com back to bring you another installment in doing keto without the crazy. Quick reminder, don't forget about my ebook, The Stall Slayer. I'm doing this because there's a link below, stallslayer.com. If your fat loss has been stuck for a while on a low carb or ketogenic diet and you are at the end of your rope and you want help and you don't know what might be in the way of your fat loss, do check out The Stall Slayer. Let's see. Okay. I made notes again. I'm so proud of myself that I got back to making notes. And the reason I made notes is because today's topic is a very big one and I don't want to forget anything that's important. So gotta warn you, this is probably going to be a long video, but again, I'm going to say what I have to say and it's going to take as long as it takes. Probably one of the more important things I need to start off with is the disclaimer that I am not a doctor. None of this is medical advice. I'm just sharing information with you. Now, I, uh, I'm doing a longer video because this is an important topic. You have heard me probably talk a lot about blood glucose and how good keto is for blood glucose. What about blood pressure? how does keto interact with blood pressure do you know blood sugar and insulin have anything to do with regulating blood pressure let's find out okay so with the understanding that again none of this is medical advice and i'm not a doctor and you should not change anything medically based on what i am saying here do not stop or change your medication do not stop or change or start supplements if you're on certain medications and have certain conditions okay so much to say where should i start i guess i'll start by saying are low carb and ketogenic diets good for improving hypertension or high blood pressure yes they are and I will def we'll get into the details why, but yes, along with bringing down blood glucose and bringing down um, insulin and bringing down the triglycerides and typically, but not always raising the HDL, doing all these good things, we typically observe blood pressure coming down, especially, you know, if your blood pressure was already normal, it's not gonna bring it down too low, dangerously low, but if you have hypertension, high blood pressure, it, keto, low carb tends to bring it down. Now, that change tends to happen more gradually than the, the, the reduction in blood glucose and insulin. So it varies from, from person to person, it's just different. You know, some people who have type two diabetes and start a ketogenic diet, not only can reduce their medication, but often need to reduce their medication, sometimes within days of starting because like like the minute you stop eating carbohydrate guess what your blood sugar kind of starts to come back down so um the blood medications for blood sugar can often be reduced or stopped much more quickly than medication for blood pressure the normalization or or reduction of high blood pressure tends to take longer. So whereas with blood glucose, days and weeks, blood pressure, weeks to months. Some people with hypertension will never have a quote unquote normal blood pressure with keto alone. You might still need medication, but you will probably be able to reduce your dose or maybe change the medication to something less powerful, whatever it is. But again, always worth work with your doctor. Obviously don't do any of that changing on your own. The point is, if you have hypertension, don't be upset, don't feel frustrated if your blood pressure isn't coming down as quickly as you would like it to. It probably is coming down, maybe it's just happening slowly, and that's fine. Now, in some, pe in some people, it does happen very quickly, and let's, let's talk about that too. This is, I have notes, unfortunately, they're not really in order, so hopefully just over the course of this video, I'll hit all the points I need to point a hit in some coherent fashion. If you are taking medication for high blood pressure and you start a low carb or ketogenic diet, you need to watch out for signs and symptoms that you're over medicated because if you are one of the people that responds to the diet very quickly, then your blood pressure is normalizing through the diet alone. And now that you're gonna combine the diet with the medication you were already taking, now the effect is like, whoa, now my blood pressure is too low. 
and I could be in trouble. So things to watch out for that are signs your medication is becoming too strong for you and you need to discuss with your medical professional about reducing it or stopping it. Dizzy, feeling dizzy, feeling woozy, um, feeling weak, fatigued. Uh, what else? Uh, lethargy, just kind of like a blah, kind of tired, fatigue feeling. Um, something called orthostatic hypotension. This is really the biggie, and that's a big fancy science phrase for that feeling you get like if you're if you've been seated or lying down for a while and you stand up quickly and you feel like you're going to pass out or you start to feel faint or dizzy or woozy that is your blood pressure dropping too low and i hear that from clients a lot and i look I'm like oh sure you're on you know three different blood pressure medications talk to your doctor you need to adjust these meds so that's um you know we really i, I think i'm i'm saying that up front kind of at the beginning of the video because that's very important you you could be in a dangerous situation if you have that orthostatic hypotension. You know, you could fall down. It, depending on your, your medical or physical ability situation, you could hurt yourself, you know, through no other reason than you were just on too much medication because your diet is working well for you all by itself. Okay, so watch out for that stuff. And um, oddly enough, oddly enough, and, and I should clarify those feelings of the wooziness and the dizziness and the, the all, all that, I mean that you're feeling that after the first few days of your transition to the ketogenic, that, that keto flu, you're kind of on keto for a while and you don't, all right, never mind. Strike that from the record. It's noted that I have to put my notes in order from now on. My point is, if you start to get any of those signs and symptoms and you're not on blood pressure medication you're just a healthy person doing keto you need more salt more sodium and we're going to talk in we're going to talk later in the video i've got lots of salty things to show you because salt and blood pressure clearly you know we have to talk about the relationship there but if you do not have hypertension you're not on any medication but you're on a ketogenic diet and you you feel kind of weak and low and dizzy and you get headaches especially and especially if you're athletic and you sweat a lot and you start to feel this dizziness, lightheadedness, nausea, headaches, more salt, more salt, more sodium. It doesn't have to be fancy schmancy, pink Himalayan, black smoked Hawaiian salt. You need sodium. Any kind of salt will do that. Okay. Let's start with some obvious stuff. If you have high blood pressure, or even if you don't, you have likely heard that people with hypertension should be on a low sodium diet. That's why they make low sodium versions of everything. Low sodium ketchup, low sodium soup, low sodium bread, all the stuff, low sodium, low salt. Because you've been told for years and years and years that if you have high blood pressure, you need to eat less sodium. There's a couple of problems with this. The first is that sodium is an essential nutrient. You will die without sodium. It doesn't mean you have to pour salt on over all your food. Some foods are naturally high in sodium, but sodium is an essential nutrient. And the fact is, in the research that I've seen, too little sodium is actually more dangerous, more harmful for health than too much. And too much is a very relative term because there are some cultures around the world that consume very high sodium diets and they don't have hypertension. They don't die from cardiovascular disease and they're eating ridiculous amounts of sodium. Anyway, the point is, there's, a, there's kind of a famous study, I'll see if I can link to it in the notes, where they show the graph, like, you know, y-axis, x-axis, of sodium intake and mortality. And it's what they call a J-shaped curve. I mean, it looks like a J, at the lowest point, the lowest point of mortality, I mean, everyone has a 100% rate of mortality, right? We all die. That's, so th that's a weird way to say it, but you know what I mean, just the risk of dying from anything other than a nice, happy, healthy old age. The lowest point um, of mortality was not the lowest point of sodium intake. There was a point below which if your sodium was below that point, you actually were at greater risk of early death, early mortality. 
So it is not true that the lower the better with sodium, even if you have hypertension. I've written a couple of blog posts for Designs for Health on this issue, the dangers of low sodium diets, and it contains links to some of these studies. So I'll put, I'll put links to those Designs for Health blog posts, but I have to warn you, like I warned you in the video about berberine, if you watch that, Designs for Health, their website went through a transition a couple of years ago, and for some freak reason that nobody can identify or repair yet, all the blog posts that were published before then lost the commas. There's just no commas. So you just have to be prepared to read those posts with no commas. And there's periods, there's question marks, there's no commas. So anyway, I'll link to those anyway because they're, they're kind of important. Really, truly, low sodium diets are, are more harmful for most people than high sodium diets. And I guess, I guess I'll introduce one of my favorite resources on salt and sodium education. I was going to save this till I talk about salt products that I use, but there is a book called The Salt Fix by Dr. James DiNicolantonio. He's a, he's a PhD doctor, not an MD doctor, but um, many of you probably know this guy, probably follow him on social media. Maybe you've read his other books. He's most famous for this book. I gotta say, I don't agree with James on everything, but just because I don't agree with him on everything doesn't mean I can't respect the stuff that I think he's really dynamite on and on the spot on. So The Salt Fix, this is a really good book. I did a review of it, I think, on my blog a while back, so I'll, I'll link to that as well in the notes. But this is a really, really fascinating educational book if you're worried about sodium or you think you, you're supposed to be on a low-sodium diet. Now, why? do doctors recommend low sodium diets for people with high blood pressure? In biochemistry, there is a saying, water follows sodium. Where you have a lot of sodium, water is going to go with it. So when you eat a lot of salt or sodium, your body retains more water. And when you, when you have more water, more retaining water, what are you going to have? You're going you're gonna to have edema, which is the fancy word for bloating or water retention, fluid retention. And you're going to have higher blood pressure because your blood is mostly water. So if you're absorbing sort of more water into the bloodstream, let's say, you have the same amount of blood vessel, you know, the same amount of blood vessel, but now you have more water traveling through it, you're going to have more pressure, right? Higher pressure. So that's one thing. It's also related to glucose and insulin, but I'll get to that in a minute. So, so you're, you're recommended to eat less sodium because theoretically you will absorb less water. However, most people with hypertension who go on a low sodium diet see no difference in their blood pressure whatsoever. Um, there are some people who are what is called sodium sensitive hypertensives, meaning their blood pressure does react very strongly to higher sodium or lower sodium. So it's not that no one with hypertension should ever bother with a low sodium diet, but for most people with hypertension, it's um, a low sodium diet does basically nothing. So you're kind of wasting your time and you're missing out on all delicious salty food. So now also like i said earlier sodium is an essential nutrient if it's an essential nutrient should i eat less of it or should i find out why my body's having a problem like normal healthy kidneys filter out they filter the blood they absorb what we need and they filter out excess or what we don't need and the filter out then you it gets released in your urine so should you eat less of a critical essential nutrient or should you find out why your kidneys are holding on to too much of it? Why aren't my kidneys filtering out the excess? Um, so, huh. There's, I, I'm, I should have put these in order. Something that inhibits well, no, no, in, something that increases sodium retention in the kidneys is guess what? Our old friend, insulin. Insulin has what is called an anti-natriuretic effect. And natrium is the Latin or Greek or whatever word for sodium. If you are a scientist or you ever, 
did a high school chemistry class, you remember the periodic table sodium is Na? That abbreviation comes from the old word natrium. Anti, so natriuretic, like a diuretic, natriuretic means it helps you release salt. Insulin is anti-natriuretic. Insulin inhibits the excretion of salt, the, you know, the filtering out of salt. So guess what? When you have chronically high insulin, your body is going to absorb more sodium and retain it, and you're going to absorb more water. And that's, that's one of the main issues with insulin. So now let's talk about why something, uh, glucose, you know that high blood glucose is bad news, right? Not, not every now and then a little spike or whatever, but chronically high blood sugar, chronically high insulin are very problematic. One of the reasons high blood sugar is so bad is glycation. You've probably heard this word, right? Glycation kind of sounds a little bit like glucose. Gly, glycate, glycation is when tissues in your body, cells, proteins, things become sticky and mucked up and gunked up with sugar, with glucose. And if you, you know the term hemoglobin A1C, what hemoglobin A1C measures is how much of your hemoglobin protein is glycated. It's also called glycated or glycosylated hemoglobin. How much of your hemoglobin protein has become all sticky and mucked up with sugar? But hemoglobin isn't the only thing in your body that can become mucked up and sticky with sugar. Everything can become mucked up and sticky with sugar. And so including your blood vessels. Now, if your blood vessels, the actual, your arteries, your veins, the, the capillaries, the blood vessels that are what the blood flows through are all glycated and mucked up and sticky. They're going to be like brittle. And this is, this is an oversimplification. You doctors and scientists don't come at me. This, I'm just explaining like general principles, just so people have a good way to think about it. If your blood vessels are glycated, think of them like a brit like a glass test tube. Blood vessels are normally supposed to be very um, pliant, very very giving, very able to to dilate, to stretch, and to you know to expand and contract. Like a, I mean not like a garden hose because a garden hose is very firm. But think of like a a soft sort of tube that as you pass water through it, it can expand. When there's less water, it can shrink up. That's how your blood vessels are supposed to be. Very accommodating. When your blood vessels are glycated, think of it more like instead of that nice soft rubber tube, rubber hose, it's a glass, it's a glass tube, very brittle, very fragile. And so when you have a lot, you know, now that you have more blood because it's more water, you've absorbed more, you have more, more blood flowing through or a greater volume and because your blood vessel is so sticky and damaged with sugar and brittle now, instead of being nice and soft and pliant, higher pressure, there, there's higher pressure, right? Because the blood, the blood vessel can't expand. The blood vessel is supposed to be able to dilate. If it dilates, whoo, now the blood flows through just fine. If it's like glass and brittle, oh, now, now you've got all that pressure building up against that wall. Now it's a, your, your blood in order to flow, it has to be pushed through harder you have a higher blood pressure. This is also why if you know somebody with type two diabetes or type one as well, somebody with any kind of diabetes, the chronically high blood sugar is very damaging to the blood vessels. My mother, may she rest in peace, had very poorly controlled type two and she was constantly having little blood vessels in her eyes burst and she would have like these little bloody red spots in her eyes. And you can get it in your extremity, you can get it in the legs. They, they have very, very poor wound healing because their blood vessels are so, you know, so damaged. Um, poor circulation even. So blood, you, you will even hear people in the keto space say that diabetes is a vascular disease, meaning it's a blood vessel disease. And it's, it's not only a vascular disease, but that's certainly one thing it affects. So again, when you have in, so, so now your blood vessels themselves, the physical structure of the blood vessel is not the way it's supposed to be. And so that's from the blood glucose. And now because you have high insulin, your body's retaining more sodium, retaining more water. Now we've got like a double whammy of a problem of this, of this high, you know, this blood trying to get through this smaller blood vessel, thus increasing the pressure. Now, another way that insulin affects blood pressure 
is through the sympathetic nervous system. I know you've heard of that. That's the fight or flight thing. Like the, like your, it's your whole body and brain being primed to fight or flee, fight or flight, to either fight for your life. Like this is the evolutionarily conserved, hardwired nervous system state that keeps you alive in an acute emergency, a crisis situation. The bear is chasing you, the tiger is chasing you, you know, something is happening. Um, and it's so many different things happen, one of which is increased blood, blood pressure because it's, um, it constricts the blood vessels. And so how do I, how do I explain? I mean, that's, that's part of what happens in the sympathetic nervous activation. Think of it like, like you can even, if you were in a crisis like that, like you, oh, you just, your whole body tenses up, right? You're on high alert. And insulin appears to do that internally, even when there's no crisis around, right? Even when you, you're, you didn't just have a near miss car accident, or you didn't just have, you know, an anvil fell a foot away from you, like in a cartoon, it didn't land on your head, but it fell right, oh, right near you. There's nothing, there's no emergency situation. You're just fine, but maybe you just ate a bagel and drank a glass of orange juice. Now your insulin's really sky high and you might not feel it. You don't feel that fight or flight, ugh, but your blood vessels feel it. Your blood vessels know what's going on and they are constricting from the high insulin. So this is just different, multiple different ways that high insulin and high blood glucose can affect these things. So that's probably giving you a, um, a hint as to why a low carb or ketogenic diet can be really good for blood pressure. Now, let me see if so much else to talk about. I don't want to forget anything. I'm just trying to figure out what order I should go in. So I don't want to forget to show you all the items. I guess I'll do that at the end. Um, let's, let's talk about why some of, let, let's talk about medications for blood pressure and what they do. And then you'll see part of why keto works. Now, obviously the most, you know, relevant reasons why a low carb or ketogenic diet is good for blood pressure is that you're gonna have lower blood glucose and insulin, right? Hello, hello, like the two most important factors. Now we're gonna bring down the glucose, we're gonna bring down the insulin. So the ketogenic diet has a natural diuretic effect. Diuretic meaning you, you let go of water, you release water. And this is why you'll hear people say that the first few days of, of keto, you really only lose water weight. That is absolutely true because your insulin and, and blood glucose come down so dramatically most of the time. Like if you were previously on a typical Western diet, you know, 50, 60, 70% carbohydrate, maybe not 70, but you know, really high carbohydrate to go like that overnight, all of a sudden there's hardly any sugar or starch in your diet. Boom, the blood sugar and insulin come down and guess what? Your water just releases, uh, your, your body releases all this extra water. And why do we talk about that? Like it's a bad thing. Oh, you just lose water weight. Losing water weight is great if you have hypertension or if you have edema, if you have a lot of fluid retention, losing that excess fluid is really great. And then of course, once, once your body adjusts and you're, you've, you're done losing all the excess water, then you burn body fat. So losing water the first few days is pretty great if you ask me. So keto is a natural diuretic. You, you get rid of the water, and because your insulin is lower most of the time, you're not retaining all that sodium, right? You retain some, I mean, the healthy kidney holds on to sodium and releases whatever it doesn't need. So because, again, because your insulin is lower, you don't have that anti-natriuretic effect. You don't have that effect of holding onto all this sodium. That's one of the reasons why people on keto sometimes need more sodium than usual. Now, I know I said a healthy kidney kind of just holds on to some and release it. Maybe it releases too much because, because keto has such a powerful diuretic effect, you know, your pee isn't just water. You pee out electrolytes, you pee out minerals, you pee out all kinds of stuff. So it's possible that on keto, you're peeing out too much sodium and you need to replace it. 
And think about, you know, people on a standard Western diet, not only are they, you know, not only do so many of them have high insulin, so they're retaining the sodium, whether they're trying to or not, that's because of the insulin. A lot of the packaged processed crap they're eating is loaded with sodium. The salt's a preservative, right? So without even trying, a lot of the high carb junk they're eating is high in sodium. So they have a high sodium diet. And in keto, depending on what you're eating, if you're eating mainly whole, unprocessed, one ingredient food, you know, beef, broccoli, cauliflower, chicken, turkey, lamb, asparagus, eggplant, almonds, whatever it is, most of those foods are very, very low in sodium and you have to add more. Now, if you're at, eating something like a sausage or bacon or bologna or, you know, whatever, um, salted almonds, these things are salted, but depending on what you're eating on keto, you might be on a very low or very high sodium diet or somewhere in between. The point is, this is why some people need more sodium on keto, especially if you are an athlete or especially if you sweat a lot, if you work outdoors, if you spend a lot of time outdoors in a hot climate. So that's the salt thing. Now, let me, I was talking about meds. So I keep, I keep saying that word diuretic or get rid of excess water. Some, so there's a lot of different blood pressure medications and they work through different mechanisms. One type of blood pressure medication has diuretic effects. It causes your body to flush out water. And so that's great. But again, no medication ever addresses why. Why is my body holding on to so much water in the first place? Why don't I find out that and fix that instead of taking this medication? Maybe it's because your insulin's too high. Maybe there's other reasons. Insulin isn't the only reason for water retention, but it's a big one. And so anyway, these diuretic medications help you get rid of excess water. But remember, you don't just lose the water. You're going to lose sodium. You're probably going to lose magnesium. You're going to lose potassium. You might be losing calcium. You might be losing other electrolyte minerals. And so these diuretics are not without gnarly side effects. You know, no medication is free of side effects. Some of them are good side effects. Some of them are things that are nice. Some of them not so much. So um, that's diuretics. There's another, there's another class of blood pressure medications called ACE inhibitors, ACE, A-C-E. A-C-E stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. And the reason there are drugs that are ACE inhibitors is because angiotensin, there's, I think there's two different kinds of angiotensin. There's one and two. It's, that's more than you need to know. The point is angio, there's a cascade of things that, influence sodium retention. And there's a hormone called aldosterone. You may or may not have ever heard of it. It's produced in your adrenal glands. Um, your adrenal glands also produce cortisol. Cortisol is a glucocorticoid hormone. It's called a corticoid hormone because it's produced in the adrenal cortex. Your adrenal gland has different parts to it. The cortex is where uh, cortisol is produced, so it's uh, a glucocorticoid because it's produced in the cortex, and what do we know cortisol does? It raises your blood glucose, it is a glucocorticoid. Aldosterone is what is called a mineralocorticoid. It's also produced in the adrenal cortex, but it affects mineral balance. It is a mineralocorticoid. Aldosterone is what, or, or one of the things that tells the kidneys to hold on to the sodium, right? No organ or gland does what it does without taking orders from somewhere else, usually somewhere in the brain, the pituitary or the hypothalamus, sending out signals to elsewhere. So the ACE, the angiotensin converting enzyme, plays a role in the production and release of aldosterone, which is the hormone that tells the kidneys, hey kidneys, we need some sodium. So if you inhibit ACE, you inhibit angiotensin converting enzyme, then you don't get ACE or you don't get aldo you know, the end product, you don't get the aldosterone saying, hey kidneys, we need more sodium or hold on to sodium. And it's, it's not that 
aldosterone is never produced. You just produce less. There's, I mean, as far as I know, there's no drug that completely shuts anything off. It's, it's always a reduction, an inhibition, a slowing down, like even statin drugs. They don't stop your body from making cholesterol at all. It just, you make less. So just like these, these ACE inhibitors, you're going to have less ACE, less aldosterone, less holding on to the sodium. But again, why should I inhibit ACE? Why, why don't I find out why my body's holding on to so much sodium in the first place and get rid of that? Another, um, another type of blood pressure medication. So if you don't see off screen, I'm, I have my notes down here. I'm looking at the notes. Calcium channel blockers. Calcium, and again, oversimplification. This is just for, you know, for all us people out here just trying to learn the basics. Think of calcium as a tightening type mineral. Minerals, um, sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium are kind of involved in muscle contraction and relax, like relaxation. So like, you know, the, the tightening of muscles, the stiffening, and then the, the relaxation. In, including just everyday things like, you know, picking something up and lifting your arm. And internally as well, your whole body is full of muscles that you don't ever think of. Like I'm not talking about what's called skeletal muscle, the muscles attached to your bones, like, you know, your biceps, your triceps, your, your glutes, your hamstrings, whatever, your quads. Little, what they call smooth muscle, there's cardiac muscle, that's the muscle cells that make up the physical structure of the heart. Your blood vessels are lined with what's called smooth muscle. This is what I was saying before that that blood vessels are supposed to be able to, you know, contract and expand and dilate to let different levels of blood flow through. There there is a, a, a very, very thin layer of muscle like wrapped around or that makes up the blood vessel. And so it's supposed to just like your quads, just like any other muscle, it's supposed to be able to, you know, contract and expand as the muscle moves think of calcium as being the one that causes it to contract and you know tighten or stiffen let's say for lack of better words so including and that effect is including in the smooth muscle lining those blood vessels so if you block calcium or reduce the effect of that calcium you're not going to have that stiffening tightening contracting if you don't have the stiffening tightening contracting in the blood in the muscles of the blood vessel then theoretically the blood vessel is more dilated, more relaxed to let the blood flow through more easily and you have a lower blood pressure. So that's, they are called calcium channel blockers because it kind of blocks that calcium muscle contracting effect. Did you know that there are natural things that you, well, natural is a loaded word, but there are things that you can take that are not pharmaceutical drugs that are calcium channel blockers. Do you know what a really good calcium channel blocker is? Magnesium. Magnesium and calcium have this little delicate balancing act that, you know, and it's, I'm not, again, always work with your doctor. I'm not saying, you know, magnesium is going to cure you of hypertension. I'm just pointing out this is you, you, many of you are probably aware that magnesium is a muscle relaxer. You, you might be familiar with that product Calm, C-A-L-M, Natural Calm. It's magnesium citrate powder. And it calm because it relaxes you. Magnesium relaxes the muscles. It just helps you physically and sort of mentally just calm down and relax. So um, that's magnesium is a natural calcium blocker. Uh, Let's see. Okay, I'm just I'm just going through the notes. Make sure. Da, da, da. Vasodilation. Okay, let's talk about vasodilation a little more because it's just really interesting stuff, right? I I I've said a couple times now that you know if your blood vessels are more relaxed or more accommodating, you know, and and they dilate, they call it vasodilation because your blood vessels are dilating then the blood can flow through more smoothly and then you your blood pressure isn't quite so high and so magnesium is one thing that can do that <laughs> did you know and i've I, I did a video on insulin and men's health I'll, I'll link to it below but erectile dysfunction 
is a cardiovascular problem. Now, assuming if we're talking about men that have not had like a physical injury or trauma to the area or men not dealing with something psychological that could be affecting like depression or anxiety, if you're like an otherwise healthy dude, especially an otherwise young healthy dude who should kind of like be ready to go at all times, if you know what I mean, like even times when you don't want to be ready to go, um, <laughs> you should, but you're not ready to go like something something's wrong because you should have a healthy libido you should have a healthy functioning you know male anatomy and you cannot really get or maintain an erection that is sometimes the canary in the coal mine for cardiovascular problems why because in order to get and maintain an erection you need blood flowing to the penis you know why why, why does the penis become all red and engorged because there's all this blood going to there's all this blood going to stiffen up that little soldier, right? So um, if, and, and I've, I've, I've read papers about this, they're linked to in that blog post I wrote, that again, in, in young men especially, but even older gentlemen, if you have no known reason to have erectile dysfunction, but you can't get it up, take that seriously, be concerned, because it could be the first sign, maybe the only sign that you have a blood vessel problem, very most likely tied to, to high insulin. And the only reason you don't know it's coming from high insulin is because your doctor never tests insulin. I talk about that all the time because it's the biggest thing being missed in conventional medicine. Okay, let's breathe. Why am I talking about erectile dysfunction? Why am I talking about penises in a video about blood pressure? Well, like I just said, you need healthy blood flow to the penis if you're going to have an erection. Did you know that Viagra, that's the brand name, the uh, generic name, the name of the compound is sildenafil, I think, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Did you know that Viagra, sildenafil, whatever, was, and, and you know, at least in the U.S., I don't know what drugs are available internationally, but in the U.S., this is a drug to treat erectile dysfunction. Do you know that this drug was originally used as a blood pressure medication? And what happened is that a lot of men who were taking this drug for blood pressure reported, hey doc, you know, my blood pressure is down, but like I had an erection for three hours last night. Or, you know, and, and doctors were hearing this over and over from patients using this drug. And so the drug manufacturers were like, what, w what, what? Are you saying that our drug is giving you like massive raging hard-ons and they're lasting for a while? Hmm. Here's a gazillion dollar idea. Maybe we could market this for, for men with erectile dysfunction now. Hmm. So the, now it is an erectile dysfunction drug. The compound is, um, it's, PD, it's a PDE5 inhibitor. I, I'm going to try not to geek you out too much. Phosphodiesterase 5. Again, we inhibit, we upregulate we change, moderate all different kinds of enzymes and hormones, and they have a certain effect. So this works, the way this drug works is through vasodilation. And it works indirectly working on something called nitric oxide. You might have heard of nitric oxide. I'm not really sure. Not nitrous oxide, which I think is the laughing gas, the gas they give you at the dentist or whatever. It's not nitric, N-I-T-R-I-C, nitric oxide. This is... Um, a compound that helps dilate blood vessels. It's a vasodilator. And um, a lot of blood pressure medications work by increasing your body's production of nitric oxide. And let's see what else I can say about it. So Viagra or sildenafil works sort of indirectly. It, it influences uh, something else like one or two steps above the nitric oxide. But the point is, by taking this drug, you end up with more nitric oxide. I, th I think it, um, whatever, it, it affects production of the compound that degrades nitric oxide. So if you have less of the compound that's degrading nitric oxide, you're going to end up with more nitric oxide because it's not being degraded as much. So more nitric oxide, more blood vessel dilation, more blood vessel dilation, more blood flow down to that happy little penis. So that's basically how that works. Um, nitric oxide also, the amino acid arginine is a precursor to nitric oxide. It's kind of like a building block for nitric oxide. So you'll see a lot of um, natural supplements that are used for blood pressure 
contain arginine, like high amounts of the amino acid arginine. Um, I think arginine, I could be wrong. Arginine. I'm trying, there's a couple of foods, like asparagus comes to mind that are high in arginine that are known to be sort of natural diuretics. And that's probably why, because if, if asparagus is high in arginine, then you're gonna have more nitric oxide and it's gonna be a vasodilator and maybe it also affects the sodium, I don't know. Let me not say any more about that because I'm not sure. The point is, oddly enough too, I, I this video, I'm 40 minutes, I'll probably keep this under an hour. I thought it was gonna be even longer, but as long as I'm talking about nitric oxide, let's, and, and you know, there's such fear out there about nitrates, you know, oh, nitrate free breaking. Is it nitrate free? No nitrates, except for those occurring naturally in celery juice or celery salt. Every single nitrate free product you will, you will see out there, especially bacon or cured meats, it will say no, it will either be totally uncured and there's no nitrates whatsoever, or it will say no nitrates added star, star, star asterisk, except for those naturally occurring in celery salt. nitrates can eventually be converted into nitric oxide. And it's funny that everybody is so afraid of nitrates in meat, in, in ham, in cured meats, in bacon, and yet vegetables are loaded with nitrates. There are some vegetables that are very, very high in nitrates that people rave and rave about. Beets are high in nitrates. If I remember correctly, spinach is high in nitrates. I don't, I don't remember a lot of the other ones offhand, but I know beets are like off the charts. Maybe arugula, I could be wrong. I wrote, I wrote a blog post about this. I will link to that too. So lots of links down there as usual. If you're ever bored and you wanna have a taste of my writing rather than my videos, the point is, you know, nobody, I mean, at least, outside the keto and carnivore communities, like like in the regular health world, and everybody's so afraid of the, oh, the nitrates, bah, bah, bah. And, and they'll encourage you to just mainline as many damn vegetables as you can get, right? Never mind the fact that the amount of nitrates used to cure meat is like minuscule compared to the amount naturally present in so many of these other vegetables that they would encourage you to eat liberally. So that's that. And that's, you know, that's probably why there's an association between high vegetable consumption and healthy blood pressure, you know, because if you're eating all these foods that have a lot of nitrates and then you're going to have plenty of nitric oxide to go around and help dilate your blood vessels, like it's just, I'm, I'm not afraid of nitrates. I love bacon. I, I eat the occasional lunch meat. I eat plenty of other cured meats. So I'm just simply not afraid of it. And Michael Ruhlman has a great post on it. Um, Chris Kresser has a great post on it. I'll, I'll see if I can link to all of those. Okay, making sure that if I talked about everything, okay, so I'll, again, I'll get to, you know, keto obviously brings down the blood sugar, brings down the blood pressure. Um, now let's talk about how to manage electrolytes on keto because i kept saying you might need more sodium you might need more sodium i showed you the book i think this is a great book um i did a video on salt a few months ago and it wasn't really about the importance of salt it was more just like the salt i like because people are like what kind of salt should i use again for the purpose of getting sodium on a ketogenic diet you need sodium. It really doesn't matter what kind of salt you use as long as you're getting sodium. I, just for fun, will show you some stuff I use. Um, this is probably my number one favorite salt. It's Redmond's Real Salt. I don't know if their website is on here. It probably is. You can find, yeah, well, Redmond Light, www.redmond.life it's redmond r-e-d-m-o-n-d -E real salt most supermarkets have this you don't have to order it online you don't have to go to the fancy health food store a lot of regular supermarkets have this and the reason i like this is it tastes delicious and yes salts do have like a flavor and a taste to them it's salty without being overly salty i know that's hard to describe but if you're a cook or a chef you know exactly what i mean it's salty but it's not overpowering and this salt is mined from their mines in Redmond or near Redmond, Utah. And so it has trace amounts of other elements, not a ton. I wouldn't use this as my main source of magnesium or chromium or iron or anything, but 
if you're going to eat salt, why not eat a salt that also brings something else to the table, literally and figuratively? Like if you're, why not use something that's going to give you a little bit of other minerals? And you can, maybe you can see it's a little blurry. You, you see, it's not completely white. It's got, I know it's blurry there because it's focused on me instead, but it's got little flecks of like pink and brown and other stuff. That's the other minerals in there. So, you know, um, and this is not, it's really not that pricey. And this lasts a long time. I use salt and this still lasts quite a while. And I also like this product called light salt. Um, it's not light, it's not calories light, it's light in sodium. And I know I'm harping on the importance of sodium, but I also said the word electrolyte. So this says, you can probably see 50% less sodium than table salt because the other 50% is potassium. This is sodium chloride, like regular normal salt and potassium chloride. Yes, it tastes different than regular salt. Um, it's still salty, but it has, some people don't like it because it's it does have a different flavor too. I was gonna say strange or weird. It's not, it's just different. Um, I don't use this as all the time, but I use it, I, I just switch it up. There's no rhyme or reason to it. I switch it up. I use this mainly for cooking, this sometimes for like flavoring, whatever. I just switch them up. And this has per quarter teaspoon, which you know is a relatively small amount of salt, per quarter teaspoon, it has 290 milligrams of sodium and, oh no, sorry, sorry, that's, you yeah, know, that's light salt. Um, and where's the potassium on here? Does it say? Yes, okay, 290 milligrams of sodium and 350 milligrams of potassium. That's pretty good because potassium, I don't know, some people find it hard to get on a ketogenic diet, some people don't, but 350 milligrams of potassium for a quarter teaspoon of this stuff is pretty good. And so, no, I, I, I posted this on Twitter the other day and all hell broke loose. You should have seen the comments, so maybe some of you follow me on Twitter, it was like wo like World War III had broken out over this product. Light salt, why don't you use light salt? Man, man, man. Oh, it has dextrose, you're gonna die. Potassium iodide, that's poison. Okay, first of all, nobody asked you. Second of all, um, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna talk about the dextrose and potassium iodide. That's, that's just not gonna go there. The point is, I don't, you know, the reason I use this product is not because I'm afraid of sodium. I love sodium, hello. I use it because it's a nice way to get potassium. Is this my sole source of potassium? No, but again, just like with the real salt, if you're gonna use salt, you might as well use something that gives you a little something else at the same time. And I almost forgot to show you, Redmond Real Salt makes teeny tiny little travel jars. How cute is that? This little baby, this little baby size salt container. I'm trying to like move it so the camera captures. This itty bitty, let me see if it says how much it is. 0.21 ounces, it's six grams. It's a teeny tiny amount of salt. Perfect for your purse, perfect for your briefcase, perfect for your gym bag. You know, put this into, if you consume any liquid while you work out, this is perfect to put in there. Um, yeah, perfect. And you, and you can refill it, you know, don't throw this out when it's empty, put more in. You can use this forever. And I do, I, I wanna give a shout out to the people at Redmond who make this. I, I'm not an affiliate, I make no money if you buy Redmond Real Salt, but, um, they hosted us. There's an event in, in Utah. They're, they're in Redmond, Utah, Keto Salt Lake. I'll put a link. I'm speaking there. I spoke there last year. They're having another one this year and it was supposed to be in April. It got postponed right now. It's scheduled to take place in October. I think on Halloween, October 30th and 31st, I'll be there. I'll be speaking there. I'll, I'll put information below so far. It's still slated to happen anyway they um the people that run keto salt lake are miriam and chris bear and i'll talk about them in a minute they are very good friends with the redmond people and the redmond people know that the keto people love this salt because it has other stuff just besides sodium we all love this stuff they invited us to the salt mine gave us a tour we went we all had hard hats the little goggles we went down into the mine got to walk around got to take you know what i actually ha i happen to have it right here on my table because i use it as decoration we were allowed to just take big old chunks of salt crystal with us. And I took this because it looks like rose quartz, doesn't it? This is salt. 
this is salt from their mine and i said the different color that's the other minerals besides sodium that's iron maybe it's chromium it's magnesium it's manganese who knows what else is in here it's all this good stuff and that's why it's not just white and i could i'm not gonna well i will i'll just lick it it's delicious it's just salt now it'll be gross when i lift it and i'll just put it back on my table here but anyway little souvenirs they gave us the most amazing lunch this grilled steak chicken salad lunch anyway they treated us like royalty so i'm happy to promote their product but again i get zero dollars if you buy it let's talk about miriam and chris bear they are in charge of the company keto chow keto chow.xyz i do have an affiliate relationship with them but they um they make keto shake mixes meal replacements which are you know many of you out there will be like oh keto shakes oh this processed junk that shouldn't exist listen i've had clients come to me with parkinson's disease or alzheimer's disease or some issue like that where uh liquid food was a godsend for them a blessing for them because they they they, they don't have the physical capacity to cook or families who are caring for an elderly member of the family you know if it's if they know this is a keto thing and they can just put it in the blender and you know it's this stuff really helps a lot of people out there so besides the amazing million different flavor delicious keto shakes that these people make and you don't have to just use it if you have some issue like that where liquid food is easy you can just use it because it's delicious and really quick and easy to make keto chow also produces little you know products that are good for your electrolytes so there's electro oh no that's the wrong one electrolyte drops it's a little hard to see on the video electrolyte drops it has sodium magnesium and potassium in it so you know this is something again that you can just put in your water put in a shake put in a drink whatever you want to do um they also have something called fasting drops that the formulation's a little bit different i think this is um I think this is no potassium this is just sodium and magnesium but anyway lots of different ways to get your salt in and i am going to also introduce you to one other product again no affiliate i make no money i just like to share with you stuff that's cool stuff that helps me if i don't get a dime from it i don't get a dime from it um you if you follow me on twitter you might have seen me have pictures of this there's this product called element the company is lmnt but it's element that's how they pronounce it and they make electrolytes now if you do you guys know who rob wolf is you know rob wolf from robwolf.com and he wrote the book the paleo solution and i mentioned keto gains uh no i didn't i mentioned keto gains in a different video i did about me measuring ketones ketogains.com some of the best in the business the results they get with their clients is unbelievable or it should are um, the results are unbelievable so the three people who basically own and run this company are rob wolf and the two guys that founded and own keto gains tyler cartwright and luis Villasenor. and the three of them teamed up to make this i know all three of them personally they are dynamite salt of the earth <laughs> no pun intended salt of the earth hard-working good decent human beings and so when people like that make a product that's pretty awesome why would i not want to tell people about it so this is tyler louise and rob there's a couple of different flavors i i just have three of the flavors here there's two more that i don't have they have a plain unflavored and i'll, I'll tell you what's in it in a minute they're plain unflavored they have a citrus that's super yummy kind of like a lemon lime and a raspberry amazing and they they also have orange and mango i think which i haven't tried which are probably dynamite it is each pack regardless of the flavor each pack is a thousand milligrams of sodium 2000 milligrams of 200 milligrams potassium and 60 milligrams magnesium pretty freaking good for this little packet it's a boss it got all these little packets in it and each you know you can see how how tiny this thing it fits in my fist I don't know if it says a 0.22 ounce about six grams and the i'll read you the ingredients now this is um well i'll read you the unflavored just so you know if you don't want anything extra you just want the electrolytes what's in here is sodium chloride magnesium malate and potassium chloride you've got your sodium your magnesium your potassium zero other ingredients zero carb obviously there's no sugar um that's pretty good a thousand milligrams of sodium in a teeny tiny thing like this 200 potassium 200 milligrams 60 milligrams magnesium the raspberry 
same ingredients except they also have natural flavors citric acid and stevia leaf extract so of course the raspberry is going to be a little on the sweet side from the stevia citric acid i think gives it that tartness so it's it's very tart the raspberry and the cit the citrus salt is the same probably also citric acid and stevia natural flavors yeah so what are the natural flavors? I don't know, I, I, but I trust these guys and I know that they spent years developing this product and I kind of trust them implicitly. They would not put anything out onto the market that they did not stand by themselves. And the reason they even created Element is because in Keto Gains, in Rob, you know, Rob's many years of, of working with clients, they saw a need for this. People did not know that they needed more salt on Keto. They, they didn't, you know, and why not get a little potassium and magnesium are also shortfalls on keto sometimes not always some people um if you have constipation magnesium is very very helpful for that and um it's just easier rather than trying to tell people you know take this much take this much do this just put a stick of this in your water and go about your day this is great for athletes they donate donate a ton of this product to first responders, firemen, cops, EMS, um, paramedics. And you, you may have seen like on their social media with this COVID-19, with this virus stuff, also, again, donating a ton of this to hospital workers, people on the front lines, you know. If you're behind a mask for your 10, 12, 15 hour shift and you're stressed out and you're running from hospital room to hospital room, you sweat a lot, it gets really hot, you need electrolytes and they are donating a ton of this stuff absolutely for free to those people. Um, so anyway, I, I work at a farm, you may have heard me mention. Sometimes even when it's not that hot out, if you're working hard enough, you work up a sweat. And I work in the in the hoop houses, so it's, it's not a greenhouse, it's a hoop house, but we can grow vegetables year round because of that. So even in the winter time, when you're working hard in those hoop houses, it actually gets really hot. And so I started adding this to my water at the farm and I, I like it. It is salty. I mean, it's, it's salt with, with some extra potassium and magnesium added. So, but if, if you, you want the sodium, so it being salty is really not a problem. It's kind of like a selling point. And, and at least the ones that are flavored, you can just put in water or I put them in, like I do drink, you food police cover your ears for a minute. I drink sugar-free, flavored you know powdered drink mixes things like crystal light things like sugar-free hawaiian punch whatever and like that's what i drink at the farm and I'll, I'll put this in a big bottle of that so this great great to have at the gym what else can i say that's it i guess i mean while, while we were talking so much about sodium and and how keto affects you know keto you often need more i just figured i might as well show you the different ways i get it talk to you about products that people I know and, and, and adore dearly. And I, I don't think I said that about Chris and Miriam and the Keto Chow. Um, you know, I talked about Rob and Tyler and Louise with Element, but Chris and Miriam Bear, again, little, maybe pun intended because they're from, you know, the Salt Lake, Utah area, salt of the earth people, dynamite people, hearts of gold, just not in it for the money, in it because they saw a need for a product that did not exist and they said, well, you know, we personally think this product needs to exist. It would help us. It would help our families. Why don't we create the product? And now the product is out there to benefit all the rest of us. I will have, I have so many things that I mentioned in the video. I'll put links to it all. I think that's about it. Again, I'll just reiterate. If you have high blood pressure and you're doing low carb or keto, watch out for those signs and symptoms that you're over medicated and you need to talk to your doctor about adjusting the dose. That dizziness, the fatigue, the headaches, the, the, feeling like you're gonna pass out when you stand up quickly, um, the, the lethargy. Also, don't be disappointed or frustrated if you're doing keto and your blood pressure is still kinda of high. It could just be that it takes time. I've heard Dr. Westman say that many times, that the blood sugar usually improves like that. The blood pressure sometimes just takes longer. In some people, it does improve as quickly as the glucose. Some people just, it's gonna take longer and that's fine. And, um, what else? There was one more thing and I don't remember what it was. I don't know. But now you know why low sodium diets basically do nothing for you if you're still eating a high carb diet. Because even if you're eating little sodium, your body's still gonna retain as much of it as possible thanks to that sky high insulin. Um, 
all you men out there struggling down there, so to speak, do consider, you know, checking out my blog post on insulin and men's health and, and why insulin affects erectile function. And I guess, I guess that's it. There was something else about how with the medication that it can take time. Oh, yes. One more teeny tiny thing. I have heard reports from people who were doing everything right, really, everything looked fine, total mystery why the blood pressure wasn't coming down. One guy that I worked with found out he was sensitive to pork. Pork was keeping his blood pressure elevated. He eliminated pork products from his diet, his blood pressure is normal. So anything is possible. You could be consuming a food that you don't realize you're having a reaction to. Who knew? You know, so consider that if, if you're already doing keto and everything you really are doing everything right, uh, maybe you're even taking some magnesium and your blood pressure is still kind of high. Consider experimenting with your diet, pull different things out for a few days or weeks and see what happens. You know, if, if you have hypertension and you're on medication and you're going to use a ketogenic diet, be monitored by your doctor, but here's the thing your doctor's probably going to tell you, get a home blood pressure cuff. They sell them at the drugstore, at least in the U.S. they do. I don't know about overseas. You know, you can go to the drugstore, get one of those blood pressure cuffs, and even if it's not 100% accurate, if it's accurate, <coughs> bless me, tight. if it's even if it's off by a couple of points versus what you would get at the doctor's office, if you use the same cuff every day, you'll still see whether the trend is going downward. So even if it's not the same exact number it would be at the doctor's office over the course of days or weeks, you'll notice if that number is getting lower than it used to be. So that's something useful to do. Um, that's it, I guess. I knew this was going to be long. I was correct. It's an hour. But I hope that was helpful. Maybe it was a little too helpful, a little too educational. But what can I say? This this is what I love. I love doing this in keto. You know, I love educating. It's the reason I don't do meal plans. I don't want to give you a meal plan. I want to teach you about what is, you know, the, the, the better things to eat, what should you avoid, how can you create a meal easily, and then you can go do it yourself. I don't have to tell you to eat six ounces of chicken and four ounces of broccoli and one tablespoon of olive oil. When you know the template to create a meal, you go forth and prosper, you know? And um, I, I, I've contemplated teaching, like teaching at the community college level maybe. I can't really teach at a university because I don't have a PhD, but I have a master's degree, which I think is, is sufficient to teach at like the community college level. How fun would it be to teach like Nutrition 101 or like basic intro to metabolism or even, not even for, for credit, for, for like college credit, but as an adult enrichment course, like they have those lifelong learning courses, like low carb diets 101 keto 101 and it could just be like a six week course how fun would that be so anyway i have to kind of look into how i could possibly do that but i hope this was helpful i hope it's educational and um as the guys at elements say stay salty don't be afraid of salt if you're on keto if you've been experiencing headaches and fatigue and just feeling generally blah be a little more generous or a lot more generous with your salt on your food I will see you next time. Tootnutrition.com is my website. If you want a consultation, if you feel like you need a little more personal guidance, if you're having problems with keto, check out the tab that says work with me. You can find out about how to book there. And again, my book, Breaking Fat Loss Stalls on Keto, ebook, PDF, stallslayer.com, link below. See you next time. And remember, keep doing keto without the crazy. We don't want keto with the crazy. Stay sane.